Yes, good morning, good evening, or good night, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Phage Pharmacology and Therapy webinar, uh, which is organized by three organizations, by ISAP, by EPASG, and by ISAC. My name is uh, Sebastian Wicher. I'm the Education Officer of EPASG and also a Council Member of ISAP, and uh, I will be one of the moderators uh, for today's webinar. We have three excellent speakers um, that will present different facets of phage pharmacology, ranging from more the preclinical space until uh, therapy. And it is my pleasure to also welcome my co-moderator, Yu Wei Ling from Melbourne, Australia, and also from Setara. And I will hand over to him uh, to introduce our first speaker for today. Right. Thank you so much to Sebastian. So my name is Yuei. So I'm the director of pharmacometric at Satara, as well as co-director of NTCPG at the University of Malaya. So um, it's really nice to be here today. So uh, let me introduce our first speaker, which is um, Dr. Sunong. So Dr. Sunong is a postdoctoral researcher in the Laboratory of Antimicrobial System Pharmacology, Biomedicine Discovery Institute at the Monash University. She obtained her Bachelor's of Pharmacy before commencing PhD and completed her PhD in Microbiology from Monash University in 2020. Her work focuses on addressing the global health threat of antimicrobial resistance. Her major motivation now is the development of therapeutic fudge to treat drug-resistant infections. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Suno. Thank you very much, Wayne and Sebastian, for the nice introduction to our webinar. So uh, basically what my talk will cover is more on the preclinical part, which is more about the bench work that we are doing in the lab. So I would say, I would just like to give like, a brief introduction about antimicrobial resistance here. Let's just imagine that you were having persistent cough, fever, and difficulty in breathing and you went to the hospital and was later diagnosed with a lower respiratory tract infection. And you were told that there is no antibiotic that works for you. Well, this is something that is happening now globally. And a report that was published in the Lancet last year states that antimicrobial resistance was associated with the death of close to 5 million people in 2019 itself. And this has already put us at the halfway mark of an earlier report that projected an estimated 10 billion deaths per year caused by AMR by 2050. To put this into context, which is an analogy that I'm borrowing from other talks, it is equivalent to having a plane crash every half an hour. Let's just imagine the world that we are living in if this were to happen. But I would say that this is actually happening as this is the real number of lives taken by AMR. And we are seriously lacking of effective antimicrobial agents, especially against this WHO priority one pathogens. And there are many strategies to combat AMR. And the one that we are focusing today as of the title of our webinar is with the use of bacteriophages. So phages is commonly known as just as phages in short, and they are viruses that specifically target bacteria. And generally, phage life cycle can be categorized as either lytic or lysogenic. This infection starts by having a phage absorbed onto the bacterial cells, which then the phage gen genomic material is injected. For the lysogenic cycle, this genomic material is integrated into the bacterial genome in which the prophage will only be released under certain conditions, such as in the presence of environmental stimulants. For the lytic phage, new phages will be produced and released following hostile lysis. And typically, phage therapy relies on the lytic life cycle of phage to kill bacteria. 
Um, so phages are regarded as the most abundant living biological entities on Earth. And it is believed that for every pathogen out there, there should be at least a phage that is active against it. And this makes phage therapy a promising, sustainable therapeutic option for treating bacterial infections. If we compare it to antibiotics, phages have been overlooked for a long period of time, and this leads to many hurdles that actually hinder the effective use of phages. I would say that researchers around the world are working very hard in building this bridge to advance phage therapy. And there are many questions that we are trying to answer, such as which phages have better efficacy? And if cocktail is to be used, how many different phages do we need to make sure it is effective? And now that we have these phages, when should we start the treatment and how much of these phages should be given? And all these questions earlier are the basics forming the phage project in our lab. And the first form of interaction that we will need to understand is the bacterial and phage interaction. And this includes the understanding of the pharmacodynamics of phage, the mechanism of phage infection, and how the bacteria become resistant to phage. And also we know there it will be the co-evolution between the phage and bacteria. Now bringing back our old friend, the antibiotics. Antibiotic and phage combination therapy has been an approach that is actively investigated to create more effective treatments. Here, we need to gain more insight into the antibiotic and bacterial interaction and the potential effect of antibiotic on phage. And of something of our interest is that the shift in the antibiogram could be used to our advantage to fight the bacteria. And last but most importantly, we have the host component. The host and fish interaction will need to be studied in depth to gather the information on the pharmacokinetics, the effect of host immunity and the microbiome effect. And of course, we still have the host interaction with the pathogen and antibiotic that we would need to gather more information as well. As for this webinar, I'm going to focus on fish resistance and discuss some lab-based investigations to mitigate this. When we talk about fish resistance, there are many ways in which bacteria can avoid killing by phages. They can either change or loss the receptor binding sites and prevent the fish absorption. They can also inhibit the injection of fish DNA and even if the DNA managed to enter the cell, the DNA can be silenced or even cleaved. And there are other mechanisms such as those affecting fish maturation and toxin antitoxin systems. And one of the projects that we have done in our lab is to identify the bacteria genes that are important for fish infection using a transposome mutant library. The fish that we use over here belongs to the Cyphoviridae family. And how we did this experiment was we conducted a high throughput screening with around 11 and a half thousand individual transposome mutants. And for these mutants that show a greater optical density than the wild type following the treatment with fish, they are shortlisted as um, for the, our second round of screening process. Over here, we took the advantage on the fact that this transposon library consists of one to six individual mutants for each gene. If there were two or more mutants of the same genes that appear during the first screening, they were included as potential fish resistant mutants. And there are also a few so transposon mutants of a specific gene, for example, what I have pointed here, the CSRA. And these were included as well to avoid missing out of any potential candidates. From this 119 mutants, we did a range of phenotypic and molecular assays, and finally confirmed the involvement of six genes that were needed for effective fish infection. From this study, we identified a resistance mechanism that is associated with fish binding. 
we found that the destruction of either flu A or Tom B gene in this bacterial strain prevents the binding of the fish. Well, flu A has actually been frequently reported to be a common binding site for E. coli phages. Over here, we actually show that the Tom B dependent flu A confirmation might be important for the absorption of this fish to our bacterial strain. The one step growth curve is actually a concept commonly used to describe the replication cycle of virus of fish in the host cells. Following attachment, the fish enters the latent phase where it injects its DNA, leading to DNA replication and production of fish proteins, which is then assembled into new fish particles. As the bacteria lies, phages are then released into the surrounding environment and this spans over the rice and plateau period. And the birth size refers to the number of new fish particles that have been released following each infection cycle. And over here, an interesting finding that we found is that our fish demonstrated a longer latent period when it infects the strains with destructed MNNE and RPON as MNNE is a GTPS involved in the modification of tRNA uridine, We postulate that this protein is potentially needed for effective translation of fish proteins. Whereas for RPON, which is a polymerase factor, it potentially has a role for transcribing fish DNA into RNA, but this requires more investigations. And lastly, we have our mutants with interrupted MUS and MUL, and they are commonly known as hypermutators. These hypermutators, they have been frequently associated with antibiotic resistance, but here we found that these hypermutators also demonstrate an increased mutation rate towards our phage. While the complementation of MUL fully restore the mutation frequency to the wild type level, we did not see the same level of restoration with our MUS complementation. And there are several potential explanations behind this. What, one is that it is likely that the expression level of MUS from the vector was insufficient, but this yeah, requires further investigations. So now we know we are know about the images of resistance. We actually have the upper hand to stay a step ahead to prevent its occurrence. And the two strategies that I'm going into details today are the fish and antibiotic combination and the fish cocktail approaches. There are other strategies as well, which I will just briefly introduce today. For fish evolution, it involves the arm race between bacteria and phages. So in this case, the phage can evolve mechanisms to overcome the bacterial defenses. And another one is the phage engineering strategy that involves the deliberate modification of phages. But this approach requires prior knowledge to guide these modifications. And over here, I will start off with the concept of phage during effect, which refers to the use of phages to kill antibiotic resistant bacteria. During this process, it will force the surviving bacteria to resist phage infection. For example, by mutating the efflux pumps to prevent the binding of phages. However, these modified efflux pumps are now unable to push out the antibiotics from the bacteria cell, causing the bacteria to become susceptible to the antibiotics. And this means that we can use a combination of fish and antibiotic as an effective strategy to eradicate the entire bacterial population. But to actualize this concept for clinical use is, is actually much more complicated than this. So we'll go into why. So if we go back to our study where we have identified the destruction of the six genes that cause either an inhibition of the phage binding and extended phage latent period or increased mutation frequency. 
some of these cause a change to the bacterial susceptibility to antibiotics. I would just like to point out that the bidirectional shift in the antibiotic susceptibility, where we saw a reduced cholestic resistance with, um, with the RPOM destruction and a cholestic an increased cholestine resistance was observed with our hypermutators. And this actually means that even treating a single bacterial strain with a single phage, there is a potential that the bacterial population will gain different mutations that shift the antibiotic susceptibility differently. And this makes it difficult to predict if a phage and antibiotic combination is going to be effective or not. And to sum this part up, I think the important thing is that we need to acknowledge that fish can steer the antibiotic susceptibility of bacteria in both directions, either making the bacteria more susceptible or more resistant. And by gaining a better understanding on the different fish resistance mechanisms can certainly help us to better predict the potential shift in the antibacterial um, in the bacterial antibiogram. And this can help us decide which combinations of fish and antibiotic to use or which combinations to avoid. And another way that I have mentioned earlier that we can use to prevent resistance is by using multiple different phages. And this is referred to as fish cocktail. And the way that fish cocktail works depend on the diverse selection pressure from the resistance mechanisms gained by a bacteria against different phages. One example that I'm showing here is that we have four phages that target the different bacteria membrane components. And that means that this bacteria now have to mutate each of these components to avoid infection by these phages. However, by having these different mutations, it can exert an additive fitness cause on the bacteria. And this leads to unstable resistant mutants that are not fit enough to survive. And one of our other projects is to develop a fish cocktail against a carbapenem resistant K pneumonia. And in this study, we found a good synergistic activity when fish PA9 and fish PKP6 CR3 are given as a combination at an MOI of 10, and we observe an even greater effect at a higher MOI of 100. Uh, and MOI stands for multiplicity of infections. And in this context, it means the ratio of phages to bacteria. So now we know that this combination is good. What we were hoping to do next is to look at the dose optimization for this fish cocktail. And this can be done by gaining more understanding on their pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic properties. But here comes the challenge that is the quantification of phages, which I will explain to you as we go through the following slides. So phages have been traditionally quantified by counting the plot formation on a susceptible bacteria. It is based on the assumption that a single plot is equivalent to a single fish. But there are a few drawbacks with this method. One being that the plot needs to be visible to the naked eyes and phages, which cannot form such a clear and visible plot will be missed. So as I'm showing over here, I have an example of plots of larger size to those smaller ones down to the size of a pink hole. And I guess you can imagine how difficult it can be to count those tiny ones that I have here. Also, we have the efficiency of plating in short EOP to consider. So EOP actually refers to the quantification of the relative efficiencies with which different cells can be infected by the fish. So if we look at the figure here, where we have the same phages spotted in an increasing dilutions on two different strains. We can clearly see that this fish can form visible lysis up to 10 to the minus eight dilution on mycobacterium smet maltis that is on the left, whereas visible zones are only observed 
at much lower dilutions on mycobacterium as abscesses on the right. And this lower yoki indicates that this stage has a lower infectivity against this particular bacterial strain in comparison to a host strain. So when we are talking about phage cocktail, where we have the presence of multiple phage, this is even more complicated. That means that we need specific bacterial strain to quantify each phage. And most of the time, this requires a large screening against multiple bacterial strains, and there is no guarantee that you will find one that is specific enough to only a single phage that you have in the cocktail. And what I have here is just an example of two phages, and we had to screen close to 100 strains to get a specific strain for both phages. And yeah, and you can just imagine trying to deal with cocktails of more five or even more phages. And also when we have the phage number counted on a strain with a lower EOP, we require another step, which is a normalization step to get the phage number back to the actual number that is present. So that is another um, layer to the complexity in this case. But luckily, there are alternative phage quantification methods. One of them is by using quantitative PCR to detect the genomic material of the phage. In particular, for phage combination, the advantage for using this method is that we can easily identify and design different primers to distinguish different phages within a system. There are different assays that can be done. Using a conventional real-time assay, a standard curve is required for each target. And this actually makes it difficult to scale up due to the tedious optimization required. And with the digital droplet PCR, there is a step which requires capturing the genomic material in a droplet. And the most important thing about this method it is that it's crucial to ensure that the size and the volume of the droplet formation are uniform. And lastly, we have our digital PCR method. And this, in this method, it involves the partitioning of the DNA sample, which results in absolute quantification. And what is important over here is we do not need a standard curve as those required for the real-time qPCR, as well as there is no need to generate droplets as those needed by the DDPCR. So with these advantages, I decided to go forward with the DPCR method. And the ultimate interest of this study is to be able to enumerate not only phages, but also bacteria based on the copy number of their genomic material. In this organic environment, we can expect the presence of free DNA as this biological entity slice. So the first step is by adding DNAs, we can um, digest the free DNA that could be present in the sample. And the second step that we needed to decide is whether we need proteinase K to ensure sufficient lysis of either the phage or bacteria for their DNA to be released before the DPCR run. And what we did here is that we treated the phages and bacteria with either DNAs, proteinase K, and a, or a combination of both. After the treatment, we did a DPCR run and found that the abundance of genome copy number was lower following DNAs treatment for the phage sample. So this shows that there were free floating DNA in the phage sample and they will need to be removed so that we do not over quantify the number of fish particles. Whereas for our bacterial sample, it appears that the proteinase K treatment slightly increased the abundance of detected genome copy number. And this means proteinase K is required to lyse the bacterial cell effectively in order for the DNA to be released for the PCR detection. 
And with DPCR, as we load the sample, the sample will be partitioned into individual tiny chambers. And so here, what I'm showing is an example that I use, which has 26,000 individual partitions. And these partitions with and without the amplified products are counted individually for an absolute quantification. And with this, it is important to know the detection range for the assay to ensure that our sample is not too diluted or not too much that it will oversaturate the system. For our study, we found that the detection range for fish was around 3 to 7 log 10 PFU per mil, whereas the detection range for our K pneumonia was 4 to 8 log 10 CFU per mil. So over here, I guess, the most important thing is we need to acknowledge the lowest limit of quantification and making sure that we have proper dilutions when we are running our experiment to make sure that the system is not oversaturated. And basically what I want to show here is the difference in workflow for both plating and DPCR methods. And in this system, we have a bacterial strain and two different stages with the plating. First, what we'll need to do is we need to separate the bacterial cells and phages, where the bacteria will pellet down and the phage will stay in the supernatant. For phages, a filtration step is then required to ensure that all bacterial cells are removed from the system before we plate them on a double layer agar overlay with the specific bacterial strings. And for the bacterial pellet, it needs to be resuspended and plated on agar. When we actually look at the DPCR method, what I did was we just added the DNA and proteinase K treatment, and this sample is ready for DPCR run. Um, so what we have in our study is a total of four groups, which are the control two monophage treatment groups and a cocktail with these two phages. Now we will look into the data that we obtained from DPCR and plating method. First showing at the top row, we have the data for our K pneumonia. For the middle and bottom rows, we have the phage data. And the lighter lines represent the data that we obtained from DPCR and the darker ones are from plating. So, Overall speaking, I guess we can say that there is a comparable trend with both methods. If we look closely for the bacterial quantification, an initial reduction and full regrowth were noted for monophage treatment groups, whereas the regrowth was lesser in the culture group. And an increasing trend was observed for both phages in monophage treatment groups and cocktail, showing that these phages are amplifying in numbers. And wrapping things up for this part, I would just say that DPCR would take over the traditional plate counting method entirely, as both have their pros and cons. If I were to compare the ability of them to quantify phage, the plate counting method detects only effective phage that can produce visible plot and this potentially underquantified the actual number of phages. While for DPCR, it detects genetic material that means both infective and non-infective phages will be taken into account. And of course, the presence of free DNA can also affect the quantification. So adding together, this potentially overquantified the actual number of phages. Operation-wise, Plating is a very laborious method where we need specific strains to detect each phage. And not to mention, it usually takes half a day or even longer to in, uh, we need to incubate the plate before lysis zones can be seen. And in comparison, I would be biased towards DP sign in this sense because it is less laborious and the ability to multiplex the system by designing specific primers and probes to each fish presence in the cocktail. I guess that is the advantage of to have um, quantifying fish using this DPCR system. And importantly, we can obtain the result rapidly 
usually within two to three hours rather than half a day or even longer with the plate method. So overall, I would say that DP can be a great surrogate to quantify stages, not only in vitro, but in vivo and even for clinical investigation. And this could help accelerate the advancement of fish pharmacology. And our fish work is conducted in the laboratory of antimicrobial system pharmacology led by Professor Jenny here at Monash University. And we are extremely grateful to have been working collaboratively with a bunch of great experts in fish therapy and pharmacology, both locally and globally. And most importantly, our research is made possible mainly with the support from NIH and grants from Monash, BAAD, and Kaijun. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for this excellent first presentation in this webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Ruby Lin. Professor Lin is the Deputy Director of Phage Australia. She is a world renowned leader in phage therapy. Uh, she has secured large grants, over $17 million in research funding, and published more than 120 papers in the field. Her integrated pipelines and efforts have been really instrumental in creating a sustainable ecosystem for phage therapy. And beyond her academic achievements, she has an extensive network with the industry and holds numerous patents that really underline her contributions uh, to the field. Please join me uh, in giving a warm welcome to Professor Ruby Lin. Thanks, Sebastian. That's very kind introduction. Um, well, good evening from Sydney, Australia. Um, I'm going to take a very different um, talk from um, Sue's talk and take you through how we implement phage therapy um, in, in the clinic under the banner of um, phage Australia. So let's get myself ready. So here are my acknowledgement and um, to the country. As Suze pointed out, back in 2014, head of WHO, Margaret Chan, um, foreshadowed and said that antimicrobial resistance will be the end of modern medicine. Antibiotics, as we all know, have enabled all of our modern advances in major surgery, intensive care, transplantation, and cancer treatment. But antibiotic-resistant infection already kills more people every year than nearly all of COVID deaths reported in 2020. So it will be our number one killer within a couple of decades unless we act quickly and mortality is higher than cancer or heart diseases. In fact, in our near neighbor in India, antimicrobial-resistant infection is now the main cause of uh, main cause of death in leukemia. So this is an audience that I don't need to explain what Faj does. Um, but when I give a Faj talk, I always like to say, as you sit there listening to my talk, there are more than 5 billion of Fajs on you and in you. And throughout this evening, I guess you will find out that it is very obvious Faj can be a precise cure and it's empowered by modern science and technologies to deal with this global air mark crisis. And this is done by knowing the right phage. So as you can see um, on the slide, knowing the right phage to use in the shape of phage biobanks, um, as well as knowing the right target. So such as integrating with the national surveillance program of your own country's jurisdiction. And this is a generalized pipeline that we follow in the lab for phage production, which I'll elaborate in this talk. In 2021, um, with additional funding, we commissioned a health economic um, analysis on the impact and feasibility of phage therapy in severe acute infections. The modeling have indicated that evidence, including data from our own studies, um, indicated that we would have saved 347 lives um, and 67 million Australian dollars in health cost in 2019 alone if we just add phage therapy in a clinical service. 
The same independent modeling estimated that having FARGE available as a clinical service to treat infected hip and knee replacement in Australia, it would have avoided around 1,900 operations, uh, three, three and 309 premature deaths, and save a staggering 123 million in that year alone. So that's what we've been doing in the last six years. We're able to save lives and save limbs using a specialized therapeutic monitoring protocol we designed to implement phage therapy. And as this has been adopted Australia-wide, we actually have at least 15 hospitals with site-specific approval and more than 10 hospitals in the process of um, site-specific ethics approval. We've treated more than 30 patients in the last six years who are not responding to optimal care. And of course, I hope you know, Australia has universal health care. So for instance, patient like Josh on the top left corner, he had a recurrent heart valve infection. Um, John saw him when he was 19 years old. And so uh, for over three years, he was in and out of the hospital, but now because of fudge treatment, he can play football. Seven-year-old Denvi, a lot of you may have heard, um, was involved in a car accident in India. She returned to, she had post-operation pseudomonas infection in India. When she came back to Australia, she was on intravenous antibiotics for almost over a year. Um, and it wasn't healing, her bone wasn't healing, and she was offered amputation. We treated her for two weeks and she kept her legs. And now, as you can see, she's climbing like any 11 year old would do. Um, on the right hand side, bottom corner, we have Rebecca. She is 14 years old. She, she has cystic fibrosis. She was in and out of hospital for five years. So just let it sink in. She's, she's been at the hospital since she was nine years old. Um, and before we saw her, we treated her for about a year with gram hat force And now she has good lung function, um, good enough to play soccer. Here she is in the photo. You can see with her soccer coach and it's back on transplantation list. And I actually had the privilege of meeting her um, last year. And the last, last one that I, I always like to point out is Paul. He is 62 years old. He had post-operative infection for over three years. He was in and out of the hospital, um, losing weight. Um, we treated him with E. coli phages for four weeks. And here he is playing in um, playing double bass um, in concerts at Christmas, um, around Christmas time last year. And after a year, we've did the follow-up, it's complete culture negative, and he's not on antibiotics anymore. So three out of four cases here that I've highlighted, we use phages from US and Israel. So sovereign manufacturing of phage in Australia is important to us. And there are only a handful of companies that make phage under GMP, good manu manufacturing product in the world. And currently there's no formal regulatory framework for phage therapy, except for compassionate cases. Um, and of course the Belgian magistral model. From a clinician's perspective and mostly researchers, the advantages of phage therapy are low toxicity. So from our patient cohort in adults and kids, we can conclude that systemic inflammation is very brief, specifically if you use GMP phages, so good manufacturing product. Secondly, phage therapy has a low impact, or it has a low impact on gut microbiome. Um, from the study that we published in Nature Micro, 15 adults we treated, we managed to do some metagenome sequencing, um, and it pretty much told us that in fact antibiotics has a bigger effect on the microbiome than the phages. And of course, this needs um, a lot more R&D. So even though we've used phages for over 100 years, the impact of microbiome is still poorly understood. So there's a lot of R&D that needs to be done. The third point why clinicians like phage um, is because phage therapy can reduce selection for AMR. So in some cases, specific phages 
can be used to resensitize bacteria to an antibiotic again. And importantly, phage can penetrate biofilms unlike traditional antibiotics. And as we've demonstrated from the health economics modeling, implementing phage therapy shortens treatment um, and hospital stay. From our survey on Australian um, perception of um, Australian infectious diseases clinicians on phage therapy, we've identified that the clinicians around Australia express support for properly conducted and supported clinical trials of phage therapy. And of course, the priority research areas identified um, suggest that there's an unmet need in antibiotic resistant and prosthetic device infections. And again, this is reflected in our health economic slides that I showed earlier. Um, this manuscript is currently under review, but you can read it, about it in um, Med Archive. So phage are generally regarded as safe and appear to be highly cost effective. And so that goes back to my, my previous slides mentioning about biomanufacturing. Um, so how, how does this slide, um, what does this slide mean? Uh, the quality adjusted life year is actually a health economic measure of return on health investment. So what we've done is we review the decisions by the Australian government pharmaceutical benefit scheme and it indicated that Australians are willing to pay around fifteen dollars to $45,000 for a quality adjusted life year. So it means that if you look at the graph, ICU and bone marrow transplant services are very good value. So are the kidney transplants, um, but coronary, coronary by, bypass grafting, um, shown in orange here, is on the expensive side. So our externally commissioned modeling shows that phage treatment is to be at least as good value as bone marrow transplantation and ICU services. And it's, it is a lot cheaper to implement. So this gives us the confidence to set up phage biomanufacturing pipeline. And so I have spent probably the last six years building Fudge Australia Network with John Iredale um, to include national and international collaborators. So this paper was published back in 2020, but the gist of integration between research and clinical remains the same. And the aim to democratize Fudge access remains the same. Our strengths is in integrating FASH research and development with contribution from biobanking, industry engagement, and clinical service. And we're also heavily involved in working with um, TGA, Therapeutic Goods Administration of Australia, so our equivalent of FDA or EMA. Um, we, we, we're doing that to provide data so we can actually have a formalized regulatory frame, framework on therapeutic FASH products. So as you can see from the slide, we're involved in all aspects of regulatory, governance, legal, ethics, um, and of course, a different level of government, research institute, teaching hospitals, and biotech industries. So this is a roadmap of what we're setting up in Australia back in 2019, 2020. And I'm pleased to update that we have the majority of this infrastructure and framework established within the last 18 months. And so now one of our focus is phage biomanufacturing and creating this sustainable ecosystem to implement phage therapy as a clinical service in public hospital in Australia. So the takeaway message here is that we've established the expertise needed to bring this therapy to everyone by reducing the production cost and it can be made um, widely available. So in addition to setting up a biobanking and bioprospecting program, we also establish a national clinical trial network. Um, this is to build trust amongst the prescribers. So if we don't have the clinician support, that is, it doesn't matter how you pitch how therapeutic value FASH is, um, we do need the clinicians to come on board. So. Um, this network is to build trust from prescribers, consumers, and regulators. And the immediate goal is 
pretty much to satisfy the immediate demand on phage therapy and measure the clinical outcome carefully. So to that end, we actually have a nationally approved protocol that standardized the process of carrying out phage therapy. And I'll explain this in a little bit more during my talk um, because there are a lot of co confusions because we call the STEMP protocol a clinical trial, but it's not a clinical trial per se. It's pretty much implementing phage therapy under the clinical trial framework. So this democratized access to FARGE in any public hospitals in Australia. And it's another feature that set us apart from um, the other jurisdictions um, that actually implement FARGE therapy using compassionate um, case access. So this whole platform enables us to identify the best value of FARGE in Australia and Asia Pacific, prove their clinical value and the therapeutic monitoring provides essential data for regulators and investors. Um, this approach has been a continuing discussion point to date by physicians groups in Canada, UK, Singapore, um, Korea, Israel, and Denmark for possible adaptation to their own country's jurisdiction. And if you have missed it, um, Faj Australia was featured heavily in the UK's House of Common Inquiry into the micro antimicrobial potential of bacterial phage, and you can read about it in this white paper um, down the bottom of the slide here. So this is our phage therapy pipeline divided into pre-matching stage, matching and production stage, um, and treatment and monitoring. So this is all done under the STEMP protocol. And as mentioned, we work with our regulatory body, TGA, to regulate phage therapy process in the clinics. So to date, we have about 300 well-characterized phages from multiple species to match from. Importantly, patients are referred and triaged by our clinical network. When patients are deemed suitable for phage therapy, they are then enrolled and recorded into um, our patient tracker. So currently we have 68 patients referred and enrolled 14 unique phages are locally sourced and produced in the last year. Um, and we have treated adults and kids using GMO and natural phages. And the type of phages delivery is mainly intravenous, um, but we also have delivered nebulized oral topical installed into drains um, and single and multiple phages. For therapeutic phage approval, we've taken the leaf out of the Belgian magistral model and added additional safety reports on phages. And these are the four reports you can see in step 12. Um, so they are then submitted to our local hospital ethics and drug committee for approval. And of course, in New South Wales, clinicians and scientists are indemnified when we implement phage therapy. Um, and I can make that statement because um, it took us quite a few years to get to where we are. In comparison to the phage therapy overseas, we do advocate for therapeutic monitoring, and this set us apart from others because we're able to collect a lot of data. And I'll show you a few slides um, later on in my talk. So here we collect patient blood samples throughout the treatment to monitor phage and bacteria level um, by qPCR. Um, and as Sue mentioned, they are... Um, other method for digital or droplet PCR to pick those up. Um, we also monitor immune response by RNA-seq. And of course, um, I'm looking over the SOPs in the moment, try to find an easier way to identify these response. Um, and I'll continue to mention um, STEMP protocols throughout the next few slides. So since the injection of funding from our federal government in 2021 and state government in New South Wales in 2023, you can see an upward trajectory of referrals of phage therapy to us in just the last two years alone. And this is the breakdown of source of infection John Arada and the clinical team have treated so far. As you can see, almost a third of the cases are bone and joint infections, which again feeds into our health economics modeling. The phages requested, according to patient isolates, of course, are standard ones that ID clinicians will see at the hospital. Um, and so we have treated Pseudomonas, 
Mycobacterium abscessus, E. coli, Klebsiella, and Staph aureus. So as you can see, under the STEMP protocol, we're able to treat a variety of infections. And this is the beauty of the STEMP protocol. Currently, the large excess status in Australia is that you become a STEMP patient. Here are the days of the treatment, day 1 to 14, and the blood samples and any um, samples that come from the patient, we actually have permission to collect. Um, and it's towards therapeutic monitoring. So, for example, we can actually look at bacterial and phage quantification as well as immune response by RNA-seq. We do day 29, day 90, and day 180 follow-up. Um, the fluids, for example, we can um, look at bacteria and phage quantification in the serum, abdominal fluid, um, uh, CN, uh, flu, uh, neural fluid, et cetera. So in the next few slides, I'll show you why this protocol has enabled us to collect samples and data. So this is the process and the timeline from FARGE matching to FARGE production, QC and certification approval to administer FARGE. And as you can see, almost every step involved in characterization and genomic sequencing of an upscaled FARGE batch, the manufacturing bacteria host, and then eventually a purified FARGE. These are all biobanked, by the way. Um, so the timeline varies from six to 12 weeks from FARGE matching to endpoint QAQC. Um, all this can be speed up by automation, of course, and having a large collection of phages and bacteria for screening also helps. But I want to emphasize again the importance of genomic characterization and sequencing in order to meet very strict safety, ethical standards for phage therapeutic monitoring. So in our pipeline, we've used the genomics um, as a safety checkpoint for phage production and processing pipeline. And this pipeline has been successfully implemented to evaluate and reports. So we look at safety, purity, quality of these FARGE stocks. Um, and as you can see here in the middle of the slide, I don't know if my pointer is working, so I'm pointing it out. Um, the safety assessment criteria. So for instance, we will look at lysogeny markers. We will look at um, virulence genes, antibiotic resistant, and presence of other contaminants, et cetera. So even at this stage, I hope you can appreciate why people like to go and, and talk about GMP because a lot of these processes, would, a lot of these contaminants will be filtered out. But to that end, from just from here, we can actually claim that the, this FARG therapy pipeline is personalized and patient matched. This is one of the examples to show the importance of genomic sequencing in our study where the patient had dual Staph aureus bacteremia during phage therapy. So as you can see on the left-hand side, during um, at admission, this patient had phage resistant ST15 and phage sensitive ST348 isolates, but they had identical antibiograms. So in the lab, we're getting really confused um, whether this patient's isolate was susceptible to the phage cocktail they were using at the time. But this picture on the right-hand side, you can see that there are two different color isolates. So subsequently, we implemented high-resolution bacterial typing rather than single colony approach. So we would actually sequence them and, of course, follow it up with whole genome sequencing. So this is how we resolve this issue. The other one, this is my... Um, expertise for transcriptome, human transcriptome, actually, we ask um, important questions during phage therapy. So uh, the question would be, are there immune and inflammatory response for, from the human patients in the presence of bacteria infection and phage therapy? So to do this, we did RNA-seq as well as using nanostring panel. And of course, RNA-seq at the moment is still very expensive. So I, I wouldn't recommend implementing this for routine therapeutic monitoring for phage therapy. But, you know, at, at, this, at, at least with these cases, we're able to gather data and we can improve on the diagnostic side. So this is an example 
of hierarchical clustering of gene expression of the three endocarditis cases patient. So one of them you probably have saw earlier um, when I pointed out um, Josh. So these are his um, aortic fruit um, and samples from the, the, the valves that um, John replaced. So you can see in the first 72 hours, the inflammation response were all upregulated. So on the left-hand side here, which is in yellow. And then after three, 72 hours, you can actually see the inflammation, the genes um, belonging to inflammation are all downregulated after FARGE administration. So the anti-inflammatory effect of FARGE is significant on day three. Um, so interestingly, when we actually look at genes involved in innate immune response and adaptive immune res response, you can also see um, the variation in gene expression throughout the FARGE therapy. And you can read more about it um, in the Nature Microbiology paper as well as the EMBO paper. So in the previous slide, I mentioned therapeutic monitoring. So it is only fitting to have a slide to outline the FARGE production purification endpoint QAQC. The aim is to remove endotoxin to ensure safety for patient use, but it's also to remove endotoxin. So in the previous slide, I show you the transcriptome. If there are a lot of endotoxins in there, of course, I'm going to see a, um, a high gene expression of um, inflammation, for example, and of course, immune response. So from here, you can see in this process, the most suitable phage or phages are selected for purification. And this is generally a very labor intensive step. And it's only performed on phages for patients that are ready for phage therapy with all the paperwork signed off. The purification process involve, uh, involves removing endotoxin, which will remain from the way we produce our phages. And of course, we are. Um, improving those steps. The end product of the purification then go under QAQC. So um, we consulted with um, uh, Peter Yang Sesan from Ansign Sano. Um, so we, we looked at potency, pH, endotoxin, as well as sterility, and of course the metagenome of the purified phage product. We then dilute the phage to the appropriate dose, 10 to the 9. Um, and formulate the phage into individual vials for um, for with each vials being one dose. And so on the right hand side, you can see the four QAQC report, and they are as follows: um, the phage genome, manufacturing host, bacterial genome, the phage batch itself, as well as the phage susceptibility, and the submitted to the local health district for the drug committee to approve. And of course, this would be, uh, if it's formulated elsewhere, we will have different SOP. Um, and all of these steps would be fast-tracked with standardized SOP. And I think um, Sue mentioned quite a few of those steps um, in her talk. So this is a patient journey, um, if it's under the STEM protocol in Australia, um, from the start of admission to completion of phage therapy. And you might think, um, how does this work? <laughs> Repeat, but because we um, detail each of the steps, the state government is then able to identify a cost code associated with each of the tests that are ordered by the treating physician. And therefore, it enable us to better estimate the exact cost of phage therapy for procurement and or reimbursement pathway at public hospitals in Australia. So each of these steps prior to patient consent is to triage cases where we know FASH therapy will be successful. Um, so the steps and the type of costing are divided into patient referral, clinical review, microbiology review, patient bacteria sourcing, matching, FASH therapy, and of course, the therapeutic monitoring. So as you can see, it is quite involved and requires the integration of the clinical service, government clinicians, and scientists. So in the last few slides, I just want to do a bit of pitch. Um, so we have done a lot of work to, to um, be where we are um, and, and to make FASH therapy accessible. So to the end, we have trusted clinicians and scientific leaders within Fudge Australia to 
carry out phage therapy. Um, we have we know how to um, choose the correct phages. We've got the clinical trial. Uh, we've got the national trial network. We got the science biobanking bioprospecting network. We know how to make them. We know how to use them. And of course, we engage with the regulators. So we're able to build towards the following. So these are the components that I actually have highlighted that we are building. Uh, manufacturing, biobanking, clinical network, companion diagnostic, database platform, and data analytics. And this is the um, leadership team, as well as acknowledging all of our partners. I think Zhang Li is one of them here. Um, we have we were successful in securing uh, securing federal government funding um, to set up this network. Um, and of course, we've got a um, endorsement from Australasian Society of Infectious Diseases Clinicians, as well as the pediatricians. Um, and if I may, for the last 30 seconds, um, I will just say that um, I'm one of the co-conveners with Jeremy Barr for the meeting viruses of microbes in 2024. It's the first time it's coming out of Europe to Australia in Cairns, uh, and the meeting will be on the 15th to 19th of July 2024. These are the topics to be covered, and I welcome you all to, to join us in, this, in that meeting. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Ling, for the excellent talk on clinical use of phage therapy. So it is actually very encouraging just to hear about the real world impact of phage therapy in saving human lives and how phage therapy is actually evolving in Australia. So let me introduce our last speaker of the day, um, Dr. Jeremy uh, Saray. Dr. Saray is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Maryland. He has an impressive academic background. So he completed a one year postdoc and earned his PhD in biostatistics and bioinformatics under the guidance of Professors Francis Mintray in France. Dr. Saray's research focuses on modeling bacterial phage, bacterial interaction, and bacterial infectious diseases. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Jeremy Saray. Thank you for the introduction and hello everyone. I will talk today about uh, modeling of in vivo bacteriophage dynamics. Uh, I will talk about two two works uh, based on studies conducted in mice which were pulmonary infected and uh, conduced also in a collaboration with uh, the phage lab of uh, Institut Pasteur in France in Paris. So I will not uh, go again to talk about, uh, about um, uh, the burden of the antimicrobial resistance because the previous speakers uh, have done a cool introduction about that and a warming also introduction about the the number of uh, people who can die uh, per year due to the antimicrobial resistance um, and uh, how uh, it results uh, now in a renewal interest uh, for bacteriophage therapy. Um, so there are a lot of now uh, <coughs> recent in vivo studies uh, on, uh, on phages, but we still have sometimes some contract contradictory results um, in some clinical studies because we have a lot of uh, successful case reports, but uh, not a lot of uh, successful and I, in my knowledge, uh, not a lot of, uh, uh, we don't have a clear uh, clinical trial to show the phage uh, superiority uh in human so we need to have a better understanding um uh, in the phage therapy and uh, in on bacteriophage uh, overall and uh especially i will talk a little bit now about uh, the how to uh i mean to understand a little bit more the the the, the impact of the phage in the administration scheme uh, depending on the bacterial infection so the, it was uh, this study uh, conducted uh, by uh, Institut Pasteur on uh, Escherichia coli, uh, which uh, is uh, the most prevalent uh, bacterium uh, in uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. 
Um, there is uh, this uh, mouse model of uh, Ecryptomonas that uh, they they have in the the Institute Pasteur lab, and here uh, they investigated um, the 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 impact of the the phage only one dose here the phage five three six p one, and uh, compared it to the the impact of to to the the antibiotic safe reaction uh, five repeated doses and it conducted to similar radians, which is here uh, for us the bacterial load uh, in the lung and the same survival both in the antibiotic and the phage uh, harm. So now uh, they, they have then uh, produced a new experiment and in order to help uh, to build a semi-mechanistic model to help to compare different administration schemes. So there are different kind of experiments. Uh, first, they to investigate the, the pharmacokinetics of the of the bacteriophage uh, in from two different ways: intratracheal, which is the local uh, administration, and intravenous, the general administration. So they do as I have done that in uh, mice which were not infected, only uh, treated. I mean, just administered uh, some phage to have the distribution and the kinetics parameter, and then. They uh, also have some mice which were only infected but not treated by phage to separate it to understand the the, the bacterial uh, growth parameters and also the the effect of the immunity of the host. And then uh, we have the different arms uh, for infected mice and treated by phage. So with different doses and different uh, ways or uh, different administration routes. So intravenous and intratracheal. And all of this uh, help us to build uh, the global model of uh, all the bacteria infected, etc. I will go a little bit more in details uh, later. So here is uh, the, the design uh, of the, the experiment. So we have uh, for the untreated mice, I don't know if I can move that. Yes. Um, so we have the the design here for uh, experimenting uninfected and treated mice. Uh, we have only the, the, the mice which were uh, phage administrated uh, at time zero, then sacrificed different, uh, differently for, from the mice uh, between two hours and 48 hours to have different uh, concentration of phage values depending on the time, but only one per mice in this case, per, per mouse. Um, we have then the design of experiments in infected mice. So we have the infection uh, by a bioluminescent strain uh, of uh, 536, HHA coli 536. Two hours later, we have uh, the treatment, the phase treatment by intrasocial or intravenous routes. Then we have the recording in the same mouse. Uh, we can have a different, uh, different measurement uh, in the lung of the, the reagents, and this reagents is uh, correlated uh, with a bacterial load in C, uh, and we, we talk now in CFU equivalent because we have done this correlation between the bioluminescence and the CFU counting at the end in the lung. So we can use all this correlation for all the reagents data in all the mice. So the, this uh, longitudinal follow-up of uh, the, the infection, plus the, some data of bacteriophage concentration at the end and also survival data. We took that uh, in account in our model uh, and uh, inference. So the modeling strategy was the following. So we used uh, sequential estimation of the parameters uh, from these different experiments. So from the uninfected and treated mice, we isolated the phage pharmacokinetics parameters. So basically only the which is important, the, the decay of the pharma, the, the phage, the natural decay, and also uh, the difference uh, between the intravenous and the intratracheal route in terms of passage in the lung. Um, we also, uh, from the inf infected and untreated mice, we uh, had the bacterial growth data and the immunity of the mice parameters. And then from the infected, we uh, had the the key parameters, which were the phage bacteria interactions, uh, and uh, with uh, also some other parameters from the previous uh, experiments, which were fixed and only estimating now the phage bacteria key uh, parameters, uh, interaction parameters. Um, so, in terms of statistical 
tools, we use the nonlinear mixed effect models and estimated parameters from a SAEM algorithm of Monolix, which is a, an appropriate tool to uh, to use the all the richness of uh, the this longitudinal bacterial load data uh, that we had thanks to the bioluminescent uh, strains and also to account for the median or mean parameters and also the variability between the mice. We also perform joint modeling uh, between uh, which make the link between the bacterial load and the hazard of death of mice, uh, which help to reduce the bias uh, of uh, longitudinal parameters, which can happen if we, if we have a very unbalanced de data if with uh, some mice uh, with uh, early early deaths due to the for example in our case in a, if for some mice with a very high inoculum we had a, an early death so an early death so we have had more data for the lower inoculum and this that's why we use this methodology um so now i um, will show you some data uh, so the here in a, so we have phage concentrations at different times, so at the different uh, sacrifice time for the mice uh, here without any infection. So we have, we can see the difference in terms of phage concentration between uh, the intravenous route and the intratracheal uh, um, administration. So of course it, it is a concentration here in the lung. So thanks to that, we estimated the pharmacokinetics parameters. Uh, and now you, you can see the phage concentration in infected mice, and you can see that, uh, uh, which is cool, we have uh, this uh, very high uh, amplification of phages due to the the meat with uh, the the bacteria, uh, and also in, uh, in with uh, after intravenous administration, we can see that uh, the phage concentration can reach uh, a big numbers. Um, so we have now uh, the bacterial load data you can see uh, on the top uh, in the different uh, arms so in black for the untreated and in the colored uh, colored lines for the treated uh, mice we don't see a lot of difference because there is so much uh, inter-individual variability and also you can see in terms of survival uh, we cannot see really a pattern uh, with uh, the different doses of the different or the different uh, administration route, but uh, here, for example, the dose is higher than in, in this group, but the survival seems to be to go a little bit down, but uh, that was, for example, due to the inoculum. You can see in this group where the mice, uh, have, for some reason, experimental reasons, had a very high inoculum in this group, and that's also why uh, we built a, a model to understand all these results, and, that's, uh, and the model helped to to understand and to, for example, to fix a certain inoculum and to see in this, uh, we host the parameter estimated is there a difference between the, the, the root or the doses. So here is uh, the uh, schematic, a brief schematic of the models that we built. So we have susceptible uh, bacteria that uh, after uh, after uh, uh, to after the infection of by the phage goes to uh, infected state, uh, which is um, more or less the late uh, correspond to the latency time of the phage before the burst uh, of the and to release new phages and the lysis of course of the bacteria. We have in parallel also we accounted for a refractory uh, or resistant. Uh, uh, bacteria uh, to the phage. So I will not uh, go in a lot of details on these equations, but uh, just to to say that uh, we have the pharmacokinetics uh, parameters for the phage uh, for the the virus or the phage uh, in the blood and then in the lung. Then we have the, all the equations for the, the different kind of bacteria with uh, here, for example, the process for the, 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 the bacterial growth and on the right, the, uh, a simple model for the immunity of the host. And then uh, from the, all the infected, uh, infected mice, we have uh, the key parameters, for example, the beta here, which is the, the, the adsorption rate, uh, the probability of meeting between uh, the phage and the bacteria, we can say, and also the the lysis rate, uh, so the, the the rapidity at at the end of the process, the the phage can uh, lyse the the bacteria, 
and also hazard parameters, including the link between the bacteria load and the hazard for death. Here are individual fits um, individual and individual projections for, that I've made uh, from the model uh, in different groups and with mice taken randomly. So we have the here the, the big circles, which are bacterial load data. Uh, the stars here are phage data. And uh, we have uh, more or less the survival data. When the line was stopped, it means that the, the, the mouse was dead. And But if the, there are dotted lines, it's just projection from the models after the sacrifice of the mouse. And, and you can see that the model can recapitulate, recapitulate a different kind of patterns. For example, you can see if in this mouse or in this mouse there is a, a rebound due to refractory uh, bacteria. So we estimated different parameters. So from in vitro data, we had a huge burst size with uh, 570 uh, viruses, 70 uh, phages, which were at, at each uh, lytic cycle. We have, we know that from the pharmacokinetic experiment, the in case of in, uninfected, of course, uh, we we have a phage exposure which was divided by five thousand after uh, IV an IV administration compared to IT. Uh, we had uh, a we determined a, a threshold for bacterial control by immunity, uh, about seven log, uh, saying that. Um, if the bacterial load can go below this value uh, just due to the phage or just because the, the inoculum was uh, pretty low, uh, the, the immunity of the mouse could control the bacteria. The bacterial, uh, yeah. And uh, also we have uh, the, all the infected uh, and the inter key interaction parameters. For example, uh, the half-life of productive infected bacteria of eight hours, which is pretty high compared to what we expected from in vitro data. And also uh, hazard ratio, meaning that uh, it were if of uh, about four. So for each rise of uh, each uh, increasing of uh, one log of the bacterial load, the hazard of this uh, for the, the mice uh, was uh, multiplied by four. So we made, um, so I, as I said, we had a huge inter-individual variability. Uh, and now to understand uh, a little bit more about what happened. So we fixed uh, bacteria inoculum at different values, six, seven, and eight, and to see uh, how it goes in the different uh, sub-compartment of the model, uh, depending, uh, and on, depending on the bacterial inoculum. So when we have a low inoculum, such as a six log, you can see that uh, even in a uninfected and untreated uh, mice, we can see that we have a, in median a control of the bacterial load, both for the susceptible and the refractory. And then um, if we go to, to a median inoculum, here we have a real difference uh, between the phage treated mice and the uh, in colored lines and uh, the un untreated mice. And you can see, for example, so even if the ma the, the phage could uh, help to 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 lyse the, the bacteria, the suitable bacteria, so for the refractory mice, the immunity cannot uh, handle for all these uh, refractory uh, mice. And in the case of untreated, the immunity system is a uh, immune system is uh, overwhelmed uh, by uh, by the bacteria. And in case of a high inoculum, uh, even again, if the phage could uh, meet and uh, lyse the, the bacteria, uh, the suitable bacteria uh, for the refractory bacteria, again, the immune system cannot uh, have all the, all the bacteria. So uh, even so, in, in case of a high inoculum, uh, even in a, in case of phage treatment, we cannot uh, result in this case in this specific. Uh, model uh, on uh, the clearance of the bacteria. We also, so here we have a, had a very high birth size. So we wanted also to to see uh, if there is difference uh, in case of uh, suboptimal uh, phage. Here, for example, we took a birth size which was uh, 10 times lower. And in, with a high birth size, we don't see a lot of difference between the the phage administration uh, came, so even the root of the, the dose, 
but uh, if we 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 go for a su in a sub suboptimal conditions, uh, you can see that uh, there are uh, a moral difference between the the different uh, arms, different doses, and also which uh, was more important to, as you can see here uh, was the really the 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 administration route in Trotrachia. So the the local administration uh, is a uh, better in this case, even with a low dose compared to a high dose in uh, intravenous. So for example, you can see the, the difference here between the the IV, uh, the IT low dose and the high V low dose, which are, we can, it can result at the end in a difference of about 20% uh, of survival. Uh, so now I'll present uh, another work, but uh, still on a phage which were pulmonary infected. So there was a, a first work conduced uh, by uh, Watch et al. Uh, in 2017, uh, showing the importance of the synergy between the immunity and the phage and using a mathematical model. We also uh, took a little bit this um, this um, this pattern in, uh, in our work that I presented just previously, but uh, in a simple way. And now we want to have a little bit more uh, interest in the different cells uh, of immunity. And here in this work, the, the macrophages. So as you may know, macrophage uh, can release cytokines to recruit a uh, immune cell to kill bacteria during infection. Uh, it can also phagocyte bacteria, regulate the inflammation. And is there, there are some papers that showing that uh, macrophage and bacteriophage could have some interactions. So in some case, we, we, uh, the phagocytosis of the phage by a uh, macrophage has been showed and in other papers, it was not the case. And uh, apparently phage are not increasing inflammation or there are no uh, very important uh, immunity effect uh, just due to the phage. And there is no clear effect uh, of uh, the macrophage on the phage adsorption uh, from the literature. So we want basically to go from this model to this model to separate uh, the effect of the different components of the immune cells in the during the infection in the in the lung. Uh, so and for example here a little bit more uh, precise information on the alveolar macrophages, but also accounting for the effect of of course of the neutrophils, which are the the main killer uh, during infection. Uh, so to do uh, our study uh, in uh, the, for uh, to understand the macrophage uh, phage interaction and the effect of the macrophage, so we we have the depletion of the macrophage by clodronate and uh, a few days after uh, when the macrophage are still depleted, we have the the infection uh, this time by a bioluminescent strain or gain, but a pack which is diff and a pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, the last, the, the other work, it was a uh, coli. And after that, uh, administration of phages, and again, the follow up of uh, the, the bacterial load over time due to the radiance. We also had some data on neutrophils and monocytes in the blood. And at sacrifice, we also had some data in a, of a macrophage in the lung and the neutrophils in the lung. And so we have at the end uh, four groups, competent and untreated, competent and phage treated, macrophage depleted and untreated, and macrophage depleted and phage treated. Uh, and here we have some uh, data uh, in median of the bacterial load. So you can see, uh, so the full lines here are the, the groups which were not treated by the phage. We can see that uh, the, we have the rise of the bacterial load in the both groups and in both treated groups, control and uh, macrophage depleted, we have uh, the control of the bacteria, of the bacteria infection. But here, so here we have a kind of um, a limit of quantification. So we in a lower uh, values, but uh, due to the count of the CFU uh, at the end of the, the experiment, so about one day after, uh, we, we know, we see a difference uh, which was a little bit surprising uh, in a CFU uh, between the control and uh, 
and uh, phage treated and the uh, macrophage depleted plus uh, phage treatment. And you can see uh, in a depleted mice, we have a real uh, a clearance, a total, more or less the total clearance of the, the bacteria, which was not the, the case uh, in a control and uh, in the control mice, which were treated. So we, we, yeah, we have in infected mice uh, this difference in phage concentration uh, at the end of the experiment, so 24 hours after, uh, between the macrophage depleted and the control, a little bit more. The macrophage depleted uh, mice presented phage concentration, which were like one log higher compared to the control. And then uh, from that, we have, uh, other uh, experiments have been conducted in uninfected mice. Uh, depleted or not uh, on uh, macrophages. And you can see that the, the phage decay uh, in the first, four first day after uh, um, administration of phages uh, was different uh, between uh, the macrophage depleted and the control showing that uh, the, the macrophage uh, are in fact uh, inducing maybe by probably by phagocytosizing uh, this phage, they could uh, a little bit uh, enhance increase the, the phage decay. And also, uh, due also the, to this data, we had different uh, kind of uh, hypothesis. So of course, this phage phagocytosis, and maybe also uh, it could happen to that to the, the macrophage because of their size or uh, other things could inhibit a little bit the adsorption of the phage uh, to the bacteria. So from this, we made a, a, a new model. Here is the sch a schematic of the model. So we keep having uh, this uh, susceptible, uh, so uh, resistant bacteria and also uh, sensitive to the phage going to the infected and then are released and releasing new phages. We also now account for different kind of cell, uh, neutrophil uh, macrophage here, or not, uh, sorry, macrophage here and neutrophils. Um, no, neutrophils in red and macrophage in the blue, sorry. And we have uh, the self-replication of the, the, the bacteria. Uh, and also we have the effect of the clodonate that uh, depletes the, the macrophage. So, uh, we, we had, uh, we, we estimated that uh, the clodonate depleted about 99% of alveolar macrophages. Also that macrophages, uh, were responsible, uh, of about half of the neutrophil recruitment by, for example, by cyto cytokines are releasing. Um, in, from in vitro studies, we, we kept the, the phage lytic cycle about, of about 20 minutes and uh, a birth size of 100 phage uh, released at each lytic cycle. The, the phage adsorption uh, was considered as, as a saturable and uh, could be inhibited uh, up to maximum of 30% by uh, when we had a high concentration of macrophage compared to the, the macrophage depleted. And also uh, we have this uh, phage phagocytosis by macrophage uh, that have, as uh, showed uh, experimentally. And uh, we assumed uh, a linear process because the, for example, the, the data that we had uh, 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 for us uh, seems to show a linear uh, process. Uh, so from that, we made the median dynamics. So there are not a lot of difference in bacteria in median bacteria load between the two untreated, uh, untreated um, groups, uh, both uh, macrophage depleted or competent. And uh, we were rapidly reaching the plateau. And uh, here we didn't account for the, 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 the death, but uh, you can imagine that the, the, the mice can can be dead uh, in this uh, in this zone, and also uh, you can see then the difference uh, in the phage treated groups. So and the bacterial uh, decay is a little bit uh, slower when we don't have when we don't have the depletion of the the macrophage due to the inhibition of absorption and the phagocytosis of the phage by the macrophage. And uh, yeah, you can see that uh, the the clearance of the bacteria. Uh, could happen like uh, eight or ten hours after uh, the in a macrophage depleted group compared to the the competent group. 
And here are just a simulation uh, of the inter-individual variability uh, based on still on the model. And uh, you can see that uh, there is a higher proportion of mice that could present uh, an important rebound due to the resistant bacteria uh, in a competent group to compare to the depleted uh, in macrophage group. Also, we investigated uh, the the dose, uh, the phage dose uh, impact, and uh, contrary to the what we had in the previous uh, previous bacteria phage, bacteria phage couple, we have here an effect of the dose for in median here. Uh, just in median, you can see that uh, there is a, a a rebound of the bacterial load um, in in case of a low dose of phage compared to the high dose that was uh, used in this experiment. So from these two works, I try to show you uh, the importance of the combination of the in vivo and the in silico approach uh, combined uh, to understand the phage therapy. So we have to understand, for example, the, the impact of the phage administration. So we had a, a clear impact of the roots, but also in some phage bacteria couple, the dose impact uh, the TRP or the under outcome, uh, we have we saw that there is a there is a really a synergy between um, the the bacteria uh, and between the phage and the human cells. Sorry, uh, to combat the the bacteria, but uh, we have seen in the last uh, last work that the macrophage could uh, phagocyte a little bit the the phage, uh, which is uh, to see that. Uh, this synergy was not really perfect. And uh, then we will study a little bit more uh, the, the effect of the neutrophils to quantify it uh, really precisely uh, using uh, depleted uh, neutrophil depleted mice. So there are now uh, a lot of, of perspective for the phage therapy that uh, we will uh, discuss in the in the question and answer session. So how to avoid resistance? So by using phage cocktails as uh, as been shown by the, by one of the speaker, and also we can use um, antibiotics and phage combination combinations. And uh, how to move forward? We need to study more the the phage to adapt also maybe the regulatory constraint depending on the the countries. So uh, thank you uh, again for the organization of the, the webinar. And I want to thank uh, all, all of you for the, your attention and also all, all my colleagues uh, in the different groups uh, that helped to, to, have, to do uh, the different work that I presented today. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much for the very nice presentation and also thanks again to Ruby and Sue for the excellent presentations. I think we had really very different aspects now that were covered. Um, and I've also seen that there's already some discussions going on in our question and answer box. Thank you, Ruby, for, for taking some of the questions. Um, still, if you are uh, open and, and not uh, answered yet, and of course, Ruby, if you want to come back to one of the questions you have already answered, maybe uh, giving some summary, we can we can of oh. course uh, touch upon this this as well. I start with the first question that was posted during your talk, Sue, and that was about uh, the different quantification methods that you showed, ranging from the more traditional plate counting assays uh, up to more um, you know PCR based more more you know advanced PCR based PCR based methods. Which ones can be used uh, to quantify phages in biological samples? That was the first question. Yeah. Definitely. I believe that Ruby and Jeremy, they are very familiar with this method as well. So feel free to jump in whenever you feel like it. So I guess that like for the one, for people who are used to fish research, we know that the plate counting method is the easiest to do at this, at least at this point, because you just uh, plate your fish on the your bacterial culture and you're counting the plots formation. And if you were to consider using the genome, um, a quanti genome quantification method, I believe the pre-treatment step is the most important. So you might want to consider whether in the biological environment, whether your DNA will be working as well as it works in the in vitro environment. 
whether your page will realize as effectively and is not being affected by any components that is present in the biological um, material that you have over there. As well as I believe Jeremy did mention in his talk that he used the imaging methods for his bacteria. And that is also a method that you can use for fish by making the fish glowing. So by having a bioluminescent fish and things like that. So a lot of ways, but a lot of studies. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Yep. So Maybe let's move on to the next questions, and that's for uh, Ruby. So one of the questions is about uh, how do you purify the flash to be eligible for in vivo administration? Um, we we have a uh, we have a SOP, and at the moment I don't I don't want to promote any other platforms, but at the moment we use Sativa, um, TFF um, for buffer exchange. And we also use Ectopure for chromatography to get rid of um, endotoxins. And we found that um, using filtration as well as buffer exchange um, and chromatography, we're able to get rid of a lot of, um, we'll call it contaminants, um, bacteria cell wall, if you're using bacteria with specific um, cell wall components and, and things like that. So. Um, we spent a lot of time troubleshooting um, filtration um, to get rid of different size bacteria, cell wall, DNA, anything, e everything. Um, so yeah, a lot of troubleshooting, but specifically the these are the main method we use. I mean, of course, they are um, Fajong Tet method. Um, there's all, other old fashioned methods, but at the moment, because we're trying to move towards GMP, and so we are operating on a GMP light SOPs, and therefore we, we use these commercial um, commercial robotics to to do our purification. Yeah, some of our participants are, you know, really interested in the pharmacokinetics, if you can actually call it pharmacokinetics, or it's rather phage kinetics, maybe. Um, you know, one question was about the factors that can affect phage pharmacokinetics. Others were concerned about the route of administration. I think that was also covered in your presentation, Jeremy. Um, yeah, and also maybe you know differences. Um, what else, what is specific in mice? What is different in vitro? So maybe it's probably a question for the three of you. Can you comment on this again? What the main challenges are? Okay, maybe I'll go first. Um, okay. For for the animal models, um, I I I'm a eukaryotic. Um, genetics transcriptomics person so i can tell you a lot of the animal models results doesn't translate to human so you just have to be careful and you know um calculate properly in terms of um, pharmacokinetics for phage therapy they are hardly any data on it so in the in the nature microbiology paper that we published for the adults um uh, using Staph aureus uh, phage cocktail, we actually collected blood. So systematically during phage therapy, so we could actually measure um, pharmacokinetics. So this is to use um, looking at bacteria quantification and phage quantification from blood and serum during um, phage therapy. So so that we have some data and 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 we can tell you know whether the phage actually intravenously is, you know, going to the site of infection and we can answer those um, questions. Yeah, I guess definitely phage pharmacokinetic is far more complicated than antibiotics just because it's very different when you have the presence of bacteria and without yeah. the susceptible bacteria. So the phage number changes when you have the presence of your susceptible bacteria and once that susceptible bacteria change to resistant bacteria and again that changes the scenario right so yeah i guess it's just a very complicated things that we are trying to answer with a simplest way that is by using 
in vitro model, in vivo model, and of course, that Ruby has been doing a lot of clinical work on this, trying to look at how the fish um, concentration is changing following the treatment in patients. So that would be a great add-on to really help us to um, think about the dose and and stuff that is related to PKPD. Jeremy, do yes, you I agree. Want to add yeah, something? Uh, yes, please. No, just uh, to say that uh, what is uh, key um, in the different models that I have seen is uh, to reach a sufficient concentration of the the phage at uh, in the initial, for example, in the acute infection. If we don't reach uh, a sufficient uh, amount of uh, of phage at the infection site, uh, the the phage cannot amplify fast enough to, and then the immune system is overwhelmed by all the the bacteria. Uh, mm -hmm. So what is important is uh, to ensure a sufficient uh, a route or a dose to have a sufficient uh, amount of uh, of concentration of the phage in the infection site. So can, can you comment a bit on the route of administration? Because that was also uh, in one yeah. of the questions where you would say which one yeah, works because better. I, yeah. And also, uh, so for, of course, the local administration could be preferred than the intravenous because as I have showed uh, in the, from the intravenous uh, route, only a few phage could uh, reach the, for in my case, the lung uh, infection site. But uh, we have seen that uh, even with that, we had the amplification in case of uh, infection. So it's a little bit complicated, uh, as uh, she said, um, the, 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 because there is not only the pharmacokinetics uh, compared to the traditional antibiotics. We have uh, all this uh, interaction with uh, the bacteria, the lytic cycle, and the release of the, the new phages. And also yeah, sometimes, because in a lot of cases, we uh, study the, the lytic cycle parameters in vitro and then the extrapolation to the in vivo is not very clear and like for for me as there is a little bit difference between what happened in vitro and in vivo so we have to be careful about that thank you okay. yep so i guess there's another related question um about factors impacting the bio distributions of the um of phages in the body so the audience have one question, is it possible for microbiome strains possessing the same or similar phage receptor sites to potentially act as a chemo attractant for phages, thereby affecting their biodistribution within the body? So I guess that's also a question for the three of you. I, I leave it for the microbiologist. I, I don't have proof, but I believe so. So. If we say theoretically, you have something, some bacteria in your microbiome that can be attacked by the fish, but that depends on, I would say, depends on, because if you are looking at the magnetic, it's not a magnetic interaction, but if you're looking at how they interact between the fish and the bacteria, they kind of attracted to each other. And then that depends on the abundance of the specific strain in the microbiome as well. So whether that will be large enough to attract the fish towards a particular site. Potentially, yes, but I have no idea. I, I don't have evidence for that. So <laughs> maybe Jeremy, if you want to add on. No, I, <laughs> I don't have any evidence in either for, but why not? It's possible, who knows? Probably contributes to inter individual variability. Uh, yeah. Could be. yeah. The next question is a bit um, probably also for Sue about the mode of action. I mean, how does the lysis happen? Do you know the mechanism of phages? Uh, is it, um, do we understand it as well as for antibiotics? I tend to put it in a simple term phages generate lysis back. Cure. So that is how they kill it. But if you are talking about the life cycle and everything that is happening within the bacterial cells, you can go into the details and it can be different between different phages as well. So to put it in a simple term, it lies cells and it kills it. But 
of course, we need to know what is happening before that. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So I'm working as an industry consultant, so I'm very interested in hearing about the regulatory aspect of phase therapy. So there's a question about what are the major hurdles for phase therapy before FDA approval, and what's the, I guess, the regulatory process um, for phase therapy is like. Is that to me? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, well, different countries have different, you know, um, rules on how they how how they regulate fast products. So, for example, FDA had a um, open access scheme. So that's how they. I think it was back in twenty sixteen that Obama actually opened up and trying to help the pharma industry to say you know um utilize orphan drugs and use it for some other diseases that it was designed for for instance and and that opened up a lot of avenue and in that same line i guess we were able to utilize that scheme to um have permission to use the staph aureus um Farge cocktail, so we were able to treat fifteen patients um, for 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 that um, for that case series. Um, when it came to Australia, the TGA have special access scheme category A, so that means even with the stamp protocol, we still have to report every case to TGA, and and all these patients are enrolled because they're not responding to optimal care. So optimal care meaning that. They've been treated with antibiotics, but they are still showing, you know, um, chronic infection, signs of chronic infection, and they're not improving. So in Australia, because of those um, schemes, we're able to treat a lot more patients. Um, and, and also I, I made a comment on there, our TGA is very receptive. So it took three years for FMT to be legislated. Um, it, it, it's unheard of in other country. And and a lot of those comments, a lot of questions is based on having a drug that's that that they just react to something. But remember, fudge is a live product. So you actually have to consider the adaptation during fudge therapy or how they interact in the presence of human had a patient. Um, as well as as the actual infection itself. So that type of regulation is really hard to lock down. And so so that's why a lot of countries have adopted different approaches to how they regulate um, FARG. And, and that's not to say they are, they are companies that would produce FARG like they would antibiotics. So they massively produce, say, a cocktail that will have broad kill range for all the infections um, and they will treat that fudge product or that fudge cocktail like antibiotics. Um, there are companies that do that. Or you can have really um, clever companies that actually use CRISPR, they will adapt the fudge or they conjugate antibiotics or conjugate a different antimicrobial load to fudge and use fudge as a carrier. So it's kind of answering what Jeremy's talk as well, that if you actually have a site of um, infection, the fudge is able to carry that payload all the way to the site of infection. So you're using two-pong approach, using the fudge to kill the bacteria, but at the same time carrying something else, a deep microbial to kill, um, to, to uh, eradicate the infection. Um, so there is Belgium magistral model, which you can look it up. It's amazing that the Belgians are very forward thinking. They were able, able to push this through back in 2018, I think. Um, and, and it increases access to, to FARGE. So that's that's fantastic. EMA, I think they're still talking and, and I think they, they just legislated veterinary products, veterinary application for FARGE therapy for FARGE. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm open to you know the audience see if they have more. I, I'm not a regulatory expert, but the, these are just some of the stuff stuff that I've come across. 
Well, thank you, Ruby. There's another question that's probably going in, in a similar direction uh, about potential side effects and safety um, and whether any of your patients uh, have encountered side effects. Um, most of the patients that we have treated so far have survived. Uh, uh, if I can say complete eradication of their um, infection. The side effect, I guess, patient, um, the one I mentioned, the musician, he actually had fever, a, a very high fever, um, I think on the third or fourth day of treatment. We actually stopped Vash therapy, but uh, it was, and you can see it from the transcriptome data that we did for the 15 adults using Staph aureus Farge cocktail. And, and it's a inflammation reaction to the presence of phagin bacteria. Well, that's what I think anyway. Uh, I, I, we still need to do a lot of research. Um, but it, it's it's in a way, it's your your the, the patient reacting to the presence, but then the, somehow it managed to calm itself down and the patient was um what was okay so uh, i'm not a clinician but clinically they they were worried about the fever so they stopped phage therapy but then they went back on phage therapy after a few days um observation and of course check of daily vital bloods and and, and all the indicators like bilirubin crp and all the you know standard stuff the, the other one that we actually didn't talk about, the three of us actually didn't talk about, is during phage therapy, you do get antiphage antibody formation. Um, mm. And that's another discussion to talk about the duration of phage therapy. So for the STEM protocol, it's 14 days, two doses, one in the morning, one in the evening. But there are other people that use phage, say, five-day treatment. or they So for example, with Denby's case, and Rebecca's case, we treated them for over a year with grime head falls fudge because they had mycobacterium abscesses infection. Um, and they tolerate it well. So, so that's all we can say because we're still doing a lot of R&D on it. They toler tolerate it well. We didn't detect any antibody, anti-fudge antibody. So, you know, it's still on the sample size of two, we can't. I can't claim. Mm. I can just say these are our observation. Um, I think one of the questions said, you know, how do you determine the efficacy? Uh, no, we can't at the moment because it's all case series. And that's why it's important to systematically collect samples and collect data so we can actually say, look, we can design a randomized clinical trial properly. And this is how we measure things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I guess in conventional um, drug development, we often optimize the dose to balance efficacy as well as safety. So Jeremy, in the first project that you presented, I see a very shallow dose response relationship. Um, so I see a very shallow dose response relationship. And I also heard this from other clinicians as well. They also see a very shallow or non-dose response relationship. So from your experience, and what do you think of the most important factors that we should consider um, when optimizing phage therapy? Uh, is, do we need to consider the dose or is there any other important factors that we should consider? Yeah, uh, I think it depends also on the, of the phage and the bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the first work, as I, yeah, as I showed, we had, we had, we had in prison, we were in the presence of a bacteria, which was the growing of the bacterial load, which was a little bit slow and also the 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 birth size uh, so the number of phage which were released at each lytic cycle was very high but uh, in real condition and again here, this number this number of birth size uh, comes from in vitro we have no insurance that is the same in vivo it could be but who knows um, but if uh, the the bacteria uh, are growing a little bit faster and in case of suboptimal phage uh, bacteria parameters, adsorption, uh, time of latency, birth size. In this case, uh, we we have an importance of the dose and also of the route of administration. But uh, yeah, it could be, especially also if uh, the in case of acute infection <laughs> compared to chronic infection. Yeah.
Hey, we're um, in the in the last few few minutes. Um, I just want to also answer a few of the more organizational questions here. So CME certification, we can't do that from ISAP and EPASG. I'm not sure whether ISAC can do it, but I don't think. Yes, Wayne, you Wayne, you're nodding or we have done it before. We have we CME credits. Yeah, we will we will get back to you on this one. So um, it is. Uh, I I don't think we have uh, applied for it at least from from ISAP or EPASG. Um, then there was the question on you know whether there's a specific website that could be recommended. Ruby, I think you put something already in into the chat. But if you if there's something else um, that you would recommend, uh, I think that would be appreciated. Ah, uh, uh, Fast Australia website. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Maybe you can put the the hyperlink uh, into the. Uh, okay, give me a sec. Into the, Let me into put the it question. up. Yeah, and then there's there's one last question uh, on on science that I spot here in the in the chat that hasn't been answered, which is uh, probably a, a very challenging one uh, from an epidemiological point of view. Is it possible uh, to implement phage therapy uh, in a wider perspective to prevent and control infections? Yeah, so more in a preventive setting. There's a prophylactic answer. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are there are strategies done in this space, and people have been using phages to um as a zoonotic infection control for farming salmon, for example. So that is something that I have read recently. So that that's just something that is at the top of my mind. So yeah. I believe so. If you have a specific location, uh, a zone that you want to look at, and you know that which are the prevalent bacteria causing those infection, you can do that. Yeah, I, I think um, I agree with Sue's answer. It's very important that it's not that uh, fudge, fudge can be used um, as a prophylaxis to prevent something, but it's very important to understand the bacteria. So if you don't have microbiology, forget it. You won't be able to implement fudge therapy or fudge, you know, application. Yeah, and we have one more minute, maybe the last one, and then maybe you way you can close uh, the webinar. So that is about the multiple dosing. Why actually do we need it? Um, because phages are self-replicating. <laughs> or maybe Jeremy as well. No? In, in my case, uh, there was only one dose <laughs> because it was a short time. And But uh, I don't know. Maybe you, you can answer. Or maybe, uh, maybe it's for you. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not a clinician. So, But from our phage therapy... With all our data, we we can see that bacteria and fudge they follow that rise, you know, the um, typical um, uh, evolution of um, bacteria being um, killed by lytic fudge, and then you know the fudge actually need um, the the prey in order for them to amplify, etc. So so you can see this predator prey. Um, amplification and a lot of those patients are very sick so they have chronic infection and that's why we do multiple dosing but that's a clinical question so I can only answer it from the scientific side that that's why we do it um, but there is a reason why we do 14 days and you can find out from the step protocol yep so Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to thank our speakers. So Sue, Ruby, Esper, and Jeremy for your excellent talks. And um, we really enjoyed the presentations and thank you all very much. And finally, I would like to thank the hosts as well. So um, ISAC, EPSAG, um, PKPD um, Study Group, as well as ISAP for hosting this webinar. And thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank all you, right. bye. Have a good Bye. day.